Bonjour. My name is Bernadette Clema. I'm the mayor of beautiful Cornwall, Ontario, and I'm ready to start digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books. Digging Deep is a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with thoughtful, accomplished people, people who come from many different fields, but all have really interesting, powerful lessons, valuable observations, and unique perspectives to share with all of us. We do the show in two parts. We start off with rapid-fire questions that reveal little pieces of information about the guests, things you might not have known about them. And then we start digging deep into those stories, the background behind them, and the life lessons that arise from them. I am really excited about our guest today. I was blown away the first time I heard Bernadette Clement speak, and so was everybody else in that room. You could have heard a pin drop. Bernadette Clement is the mayor of Cornwall, Ontario, and she is a true trailblazer. She's the first woman in the history of that city to become mayor. She's also the first black woman to be the mayor of any city in Ontario. In our conversation, we talk about so many powerful life lessons from her personal experience growing up in a mixed-race household, the racism her family experienced, her sister being called Aunt Jemima in school, and how when that brand was removed very recently, long overdue by the way, it actually brought her and her sister to tears. We talk about Black Lives Matter and why Bernadette approaches it from a place of love. We talk about a very different approach that she brings to leadership. For example, why listening is good leadership. How seeking consensus as a leader is more powerful than being decisive. We talk about harnessing your identity for strength and so much more. Now, one last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, then please post a review on iTunes and elsewhere and share this podcast with your network. And please subscribe to it. And if you're looking for more information about the show, if you want to read my daily blog, I post every single day of the year a very short lesson or observation. Or if you want to subscribe to my weekly newsletter, it's called The Weekly Dig, and it has five very quick items I've learned about each week, then please go to our website, letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. You can also find a link there to my TEDx talk. Now, let's start digging deep with Bernadette Clément. Bernadette, it is such a pleasure to speak with you. You and I were part of an event last year called The Kindness of Strangers, and I was so inspired by your speech at that event. I couldn't wait to have you on this podcast, and I've really been looking forward to it. You have such a great message to share and such a powerful story, and I'm really excited. So thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. I enjoyed meeting you. That was a great event, Mark. Um, a refugee 613 fundraiser. And um, it was it was a, a fun time. I'd never sort of done that TED Talk style, you know, with the mic on and no notes. Uh, and you were a big part of making all of us feel really comfortable about that. What I remember about that night is just how quiet the audience was. It was sort of an electric atmosphere in the room. There were some other great speakers as well, including David Johnston, the former governor general, and uh, some really powerful stories, some great guests and and uh and everybody in the audience was just so receptive to what everyone was saying i thought it was really powerful yeah it was an honor to be on stage with with those speakers i was stunned by the audience reaction they were so engaged i actually had to readjust how i was speaking because i was reacting to them so much i had to um you know sort of lean into their um to their laughter to their and so I had to readjust as I was giving the speech. It was really, really mm. intense. Yeah. Mm. All right. Let's get to some of our questions on digging deep. What would you say is your fondest childhood memory? <laughs> um, station wagon. My parents, uh, retired teachers now, had a station wagon. And we drove across Canada actually numerous times because mom has family at Manitoba, in Saskatchewan, uh, and Alberta, and BC. So back of the station wagon, all three of us sort of sliding around. There were not as many seatbelts back then, Mark. <laughs> no, I can remember walking around on the back seat when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but those were fun memories, those summers out west. 
Sounds great. Family road trips. Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? You know what? 10, 11. So the Montreal Olympics, I grew up in Montreal and the Olympics were in 1976. So I was 11 and Nadia Komenich, uh, you remember her? She was a gymnast. Yeah. And she was like scoring a perfect 10. And I just thought, wow, it's so cool to be in Montreal, to be in Canada, to be hosting the Olympics. Look how, look how this country can do this. And look at these athletes and this Romanian girl who was about my age um, on the national, international stage doing so brilliantly. Yeah, that was an amazing moment. What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? <laughs> you know what? I really, I remember answering, uh, you know, that test where you have to figure out what you want to do. And I wanted to be a diva in the sense that I wanted to be a singer on stage, except I can't sing, Mark. So that, that kind of didn't work out. Um, but I, I wanted to be a clinical psychologist, actually. I thought that that's what I would do in life. Interesting. Yeah. What would you say is your life story in six words? Okay. Family, friends, community, work, music, love. I like it. <laughs> What is your greatest mistake and what did you learn from it? Oh, so many mistakes in my life. Um, and that's a good thing, right? I mean, it means that you're living when you're making mistakes. Communication. Um, I remember a client, I've been a lawyer for 30 years now. Uh, I remember a client, not, not me not being able to manage his anger and him becoming more angry. Vulnerable person. And I just didn't take the time necessary for him. And so sometimes you have to adjust to the person that you're working for, working with. And I, I learned a lot about communication from a very angry client. Also, the fire ban here in Cornwall, since I've been mayor, uh, we instituted a, a fire ban without properly consulting the community first. This was a big shift for community activity. And when you don't communicate and consult first and slow down, you get into trouble. Interesting. For what do you feel most grateful? My family, my parents, um, brilliant parents, uh, good teachers, good community members, good family members, brilliant parents. So mom and pop. What has been the best year of your life so far and why? Uh, becoming mayor in 2018. I love Cornwall. I love where I live and to be elected mayor. Also the first woman mayor in the 235 year history of Cornwall is, it still gives me shivers to say that out loud, um, that, I, that I have the honor of um, wearing that title and um, becoming the first black woman mayor in Ontario, also a huge honor. So 2018, best, best and hardest, that was a hard year too. Campaigning, running for mayor, um, it was tough. And uh, so winning that election was great. So what was the toughest year of your life so far? Was it that year? That year was tough, uh, but my uh, pop is a two-time cancer survivor and going through cancer with him was difficult. Um, I know people understand that, people who have had cancer, who have family members that have had cancer. Wow, um, tough. What one person has had the greatest impact on your life? can't answer that one because there's not just one person, Mark. Uh, my mom and my pop and my auntie Anne-Marie uh, Bansfield uh, and my former boss and mentor and campaign manager, Etienne saint So I've got to, I've got to give shout outs to those four okay. and there are many, many more along the way. What is the most important lesson that you would share with other people? Don't judge people. Don't, uh, don't waste time with that. Whenever I have done that, um, I've, it's been unhelpful, unproductive, and um, just a waste of time. So kindness, if you're kind and you're avoiding judging people, you're much more productive and you're much more, you, you touch, you're much more in touch with love and um, you're much more effective at no matter what it is that you're doing. So don't judge, be kind. What's the biggest factor that led you to where you are today? So it is, uh, it really is to have 
self-confidence and to um, love who you are. And my parents taught me that, that, you know, life is going to throw all kinds of challenges at you. But if you, you know, know who you are and love who you are, then you're, you're going to be better able to love those around you who are going to love you back or not love you, right? Um, and so you deal with a strife and negativity and hate and anger. You deal with it much better if you love yourself. What would people be most surprised to learn about you? <laughs> I think my taste in music runs very young. I love anything super current. Um, I listen almost only to Top 40, and I love uh, rap music, Mark. Uh, Kendrick Lamar is a current favorite. I have him on a lot in my car. Right on. <laughs> what, what's your secret talent? <laughs> um. So I'm a really good dancer. I don't think that's secret because anybody who's seen me dance would know that I'm pretty decent at that. You know what I discovered recently is that I'm a pretty good talk show host. Uh, I've, I, during the pandemic, I would do Facebook Lives on my uh, social media channels to connect, connect with the community and keep them informed during, during COVID-19. And then I discovered that I really like that. The more guests, the better. Um, and I just channel, I channel like my Oprah Winfrey um, skills. I didn't know I had that. <laughs> You'd be great at that. That could, be, that could be your career after politics, maybe. What's the most fun you've ever had? Oh, traveling. Um, backpacking. So uh, in my 20s, I backpacked, you know, across Europe with family, with friends, sometimes alone. Uh, took several months off to do that, actually. And that was um, a real... Uh, fun and also a journey of self-discovery. When you travel alone, you learn a lot about yourself. Yeah. What's the scariest thing you've ever done? Oh, run for office. No question. Um, first did that in 2006, ran for city council. I ran also federally twice. Um, and it's, so running for office is, I mean, you have a lawn sign with your face on it, Mark, all across town. I mean, that is a lesson in, Wow, putting yourself out there. And that's scary to do that, especially if you're going to do that in a transparent and vulnerable way. I run with my heart on my sleeve always. I don't know how else to do that. Uh, I don't know how else to run for office. But when you do that, you're, you're vulnerable too. And that is scary. What's your boldest prediction for the future? <laughs> oh, I think that Canada is going to get it together in its um, relationship with Indigenous peoples. I think it's my greatest hope, but I'm going to be bold and say that we're going to make strides in that direction. What would be the message of your commencement address? I'm going to go back to the kindness piece. Um, it is, it's, essential. You know, I was talking to my niece the other day about high school and bullying and um, the different groups, right? The different, the popular crowd and the, the in crowd and the nerdy crowd and all of those terms that we still use. And my niece said to me, I don't feel like talking about those groups that way. It feels unkind. She's 12. And I thought, wow, she's got it. You know, we, we, we need to step back before we label people, before we categorize and be kind first. Be kind first. I like that. What has been the greatest turning point in your life so far? Well, becoming mayor, becoming a woman leader in 2018, uh, it reminds me of how far we still have to go. Um, as women in leadership roles. It's, it's striking. People were shocked that I was the first uh, woman mayor in Cornwall in 2018. How come that hadn't happened before then? And then being in the role, I'm still sort of pushing against perceptions of leaders, right? Leaders should be uh, decisive, very quick, very aggressive. Um, I like to seek consensus. I like to take time to consult. That Those are the lessons I've learned in my life. But people are not used to that. People are not used to saying, okay, I need your decision now. No, I'm actually going to make 10 phone calls before I make that decision. What? You're going to make 10 phone calls. Yeah, I have to. 
I have to talk to people before I decide. There's been an adjustment around that. So, yeah. And then 2020, Black Lives Matter, a, a decisive moment for me in terms of accepting my identity and understanding that my identity, my complicated identity connects me to so many people and to so many things. And I need to uh, tap into that way more than I have to date. What's been a recent epiphany for you? So the understanding that the hurts from the past um, stay alive and so you need to deal with those hurts and you need to talk about them and express them and connect with people around that, those hurts. And I'm referring specifically to Black Lives Matter and realizing that, you know, my identity as a black woman really has a meaning, not just for me, but for other black women, for younger black women. And so I need to talk about that and be out there more in terms of how I feel about that and how that's shaped my life. We'll talk more about that, a lot more about that coming up. Uh, What book are you most likely to recommend to other people? Oh, so two favorite books, Fall on Your Knees by Anne-Marie MacDonald and Clara Callan by Richard B. Wright. I love Canadian novels, first of all, so that's my bias. Um, Fall on Your Knees is just this meaty novel set on the East Coast and also in New York City, favorite places for me. Uh, And Clara Callan is just, I read that when I was in my 30s, and it's about a single woman um, in her 30s, and I was that. She was in rural Ontario, and um, I was just stunned that a man could write a female character so brilliantly. I was impressed. (laughs) Interesting. All right. Thank you for answering those questions. In just a moment, we'll start Digging Deep with Bernadette Clément. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. We are digging deep with Bernadette Clément. And Bernadette, you raised your parents a number of times in those initial answers. That says a lot, I think. Your brilliant parents, as you describe them. So tell me about your mom and pop. Sure. So mom is Franco Manitoben. So um, I get my Francophone identity. I I describe myself as a Francophone woman, a Franco-Ontarian woman. She uh, grew up in Manitoba, came to Montreal and became a teacher and met my Trinidadian pop, also a teacher. He had come to Canada to go to university, become a teacher, and they met teaching high school, Marymount High School in Montreal. And they still live about a mile away from that high school where they met. 
and they're just uh, brilliant people. They met and married in 1964 at a time when there was no such thing really, not very often that you saw a black man marrying a white woman. My grandparents, my maternal grandparents did not go to that wedding. So it was not, um, it was not accepted. Uh, but they forged ahead and they raised three children, three black children. My mother raised three black children in Montreal. And it was, I, I'm sure they were trailblazers um, in their time. And I am inspired by them always. Do you have a sense of what that experience was like for them? I, I want to hear about your experience in a moment, but for your parents as a mixed race couple in that time. Do you know what it was like for them? You know, they tried to be very positive. They didn't want us to be scared of the world. So they didn't dwell on that, but they were, they were honest. And that came through in the summertime when we would, you know, pile into the station wagon. My parents had summers off as teachers and we would travel out West to visit with my mom's family but we would also travel in the U.S. a lot. We would take um, trips in that station wagon. And we were careful in the U.S. because of my father and mother fearing the way that people would react to them and to us as a family. And learning that made me, made me understand that what they were doing was brave, um, unusual, not always welcome. And so I guess I learned that in my sort of early teens, I had an understanding of that, how difficult it was for them in terms of, you know, limiting, limiting where they might go because they wanted, they wanted to make sure we were safe. What about your experience? And, and I have to say, I'm fascinated by this because I have a mixed race background, but it's not evident in me. So I grew up mm -hmm. as a white boy but I have a Chinese grandfather. And so mm -hmm. my grandparents were a mixed race. And um, so I'm always really interested in understanding that experience because it's not one that I had to go through. So for you, what was it like? It was always being the only one in the room, always, everywhere, uh, except at home. At home, you know, we were all the same tribe, family, pod, but outside in the classroom, in the schoolyard, um, in a workplace, it, there weren't a lot of kids that um, were biracial. And, you know, it, it, so it was lonely. It was lonely, except at home where we were close and we understood each other. Sometimes, you know, you, you try to seek out people that look like you or are like you. Um, but that's hard to do when you're alone. Now, I find that there are much, many more stories of uh, families that are mixed. Uh, my own nieces and nephews will have, you know, different experiences. But uh, for me, my sister, my brother, it was sometimes lonely. Is it particularly different being uh, of mixed race rather than uh, one race or another, because that's, that's almost like a, it's a hybrid kind of category, right? So it's a, yeah. if, if you're both your parents were black, that would have been a, a completely different experience than having one black and one white parent, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would, I found myself arguing with people, right? So people would always, people still want to categorize you and know where you're from. It's surprising how often I still get asked, so what are you? Where are you from? You know, and I like to tease and say, well, I'm from Montreal. That's not what they're getting at when they ask me that question. Uh, or I'm from Cornwall. Um, it's, it's interesting because I define myself as a black woman. I always have. But people would then say to me, well, does that mean that you're rejecting your white mother? Well, no, I, I love mom. I am a francophone, but I am a black person. And Society sees me as a black person, as a person of color. Um, but I also define myself that way because I get to do that. I've learned that with identity, you get to own that and select that for yourself. 
And so the last few years I've learned that. But yes, I do find myself arguing with people, white and black people, by the way, who want to understand why I define myself as black. So it is complicated, but I feel in the last 10 years and particularly in the last two years, much more confident about being who I am. You know what? Barack Obama made it a little easier too. Can I say that? Because he is a biracial person uh, raised by his mom, his white mom, uh, and but always has defined himself as a black man. And when he was elected president of the U.S., all those conversations took place, right, for him. And it was interesting for me to hear that out. Now I'm watching Kamala Harris answer the same questions about her background because she is black and Southeast Asian, right? And so people are saying, well, what are you exactly? She defines herself as a black woman. I do too. And she also went to high school in Montreal. She did at the same time because she and I are the same age. I never met her, but I like to think that sometimes we were on the same bus together. Right. (laughs) And somehow that's so cool. (laughs) What you said there about being able to choose your own identity, I think is really powerful. And I think that's a pretty recent phenomenon in a lot of ways. I think in the past it was society telling you, and this, this goes to gender and race and every other aspect of identity. And now I think we're moving into an era where people can choose how they identify and that's 100% up to them or should be. Exactly. Um, and I experienced that during my campaign for mayor in 2018. You know, there were people around me telling me, don't talk about your identity right? You're running for mayor. It doesn't matter that you're a woman, that you're a black woman. These things are not relevant in the race. So, okay. I I was okay with that. And we talked about taxes and, you know, uh, the wastewater treatment plant and roads and all the traditional municipal things, which was fine. But the night of the election, when I wanted to thank people for electing me and thank my parents and the volunteers. I spoke of my identity that night about being so proud of my heritage and proud of how that drives me to do what I do in my work, in my life. And the reaction was huge. (laughs) I mean, I was doing interviews on CBC and radio and all of this because people wanted to hear about a person who is so confident and proud of her heritage. Well, yeah, I realize that that is a powerful thing for me. It connects me to people in a way that is powerful and I need to own it. And so it was a big year for me in terms of owning my identity and understanding how powerful that is both for myself and for others. It's interesting you mentioned Barack Obama because I remember uh, hearing some people say as he was running for president, why is he calling himself black when he's half white and he was raised by his white mother and his white grandparents? And I remember thinking at the time, uh, I'm sure there are thousands of times in Barack Obama's life where appearing to be black or part black was held against him and worked to his disadvantage because of the way our society is structured, surely we can allow him the choice of calling himself black if that's what he chooses to do, right? We're not going to disqualify him for being black after treating him as a black man for his whole life, right? So uh, beautifully said. And, and just, you know, the, the, it's true. There was a real deep irony in all of that. And watching him deal with that was really instructive for me. Also, it made it cool Like, it's important to get positive messages. Here is a a man who is the president of the United States, who is biracial, who describes himself as a black man. What a great message for those of us who are still trying to figure out who we are and try to assert that with pride instead of defensiveness, right? Um, So, yeah, Barack um, will always be uh, a huge, a huge inspiration. You mentioned that you didn't highlight your identity during the campaign. Was that a difficult choice? And, and I'm not saying it necessarily should have been, because I think there are a couple of elements to that. You could, you could choose to play it down uh, for the wrong reasons or the right reasons, right? I think there are two different decisions there. You could choose to play it down because you're afraid of where the conversation will go, or you're afraid people won't vote for you, or 
you don't want to, to uh, appear to be exploiting it or those kinds of things. Or you can play it down because you want your campaign to be about the issues and not about your identity. And I think those are two different decisions. But was it a difficult decision? I think there was a blend of things going on. I personally, I think I wanted to assert my identity more and I was made to feel uncomfortable about that because people would say, well, don't use that. Don't use your gender, for instance, um, or, you know, trying to be the first as uh, a motivator. But there was also this discomfort around how people would react to me as a woman, as a black woman, right? So there were, don't use it, but also worry about it backfiring against you. So rather than actually talking about how it made me feel to assert who I am, right? Because if you are in love with who you are as a person, then you, then you push that out. You push out that love and that confidence on the campaign trail. So, you know, it was hard for me to not deal with that. At the same time, though, it was interesting because I would have conversations with women um, and little girls every day who would say to me, it's so cool that you're doing this. So I understood that, you know, there was a power and a positive power in that, in that message of who I am and, and doing things. It's just what women do now. They run for office. It's what black women do. It's not that big a deal. And you know what? Cornwall knows me. I've been here 30 years and they just, I think that, that, that election day, they just elected Bernadette. They know who I am and they elected me because they know me and that's fine too. Right. So it's a blend of all the things. Does it matter? Not really. Does it matter to some? Yes, a lot. And so you kind of sort of have to go with that whole variety of issues, right? Tell me about the nine-year-old girl that you met on the campaign trail. You shared that in your speech last year, and I thought it was a great story. So that's yeah. one of those moments where I think you started to realize that, that while there was a campaign going on, to decide who would be the best mayor for the next four years. There was also something else happening too. Her name is Jersey. And um, she is uh, a little girl that lives here in Cornwall, born in Cornwall. And she was with um, her big sister and they were helping me campaign. So we were in the car and we were going off to a neighborhood. We had like campaign signs and pamphlets and we were talking about all this stuff. And she's sitting in the back seat of the car and she tugs at my hair from the back seat, you know, and she says, Oh, your hair is just like mine. You know, we have kind of curly hair. And uh, I said, yeah, we do. And she said, you know, one day I'm going to run for mayor too. And it was so immediate, my reaction to that, because there was such a connection between her being with somebody who looks like her and watching that person do things that she could do and that she can picture herself doing. I never pictured myself running for office. Never. I don't, come from a family of politicians, nor did I ever see in Montreal um, politicians who looked like me. I'm not saying that there weren't black women in politics, you know. Um, so, you know, we, we had had some, um, you know, some representation and that was good, but so little, so little, so that it just didn't seem like something real almost. Right. Um, and I had never met any uh, personally. And so I think that makes a difference. Yeah. And that moment sounds so powerful to me because that's a moment where you realize that this milestone obviously can be very much an achievement for you, but it also means so much to so many other people that there is a woman who's a leader and that there's a black woman who's a leader. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and, it was powerful for her to be able to tug on my hair, right? And to walk up to doors with me. Um, and so it's very important 
that you put out a message through social media and all of that, but it's also very important to personally connect with people. And I realize, and now that we're in this pandemic and we're doing Zoom, like I'm doing, I'm using Zoom more to connect with more people, but I want to connect with young women and young black women, young women of color uh, in person, because these conversations are powerful. In-person Zoom meeting conversations are powerful. Can you talk a little more about role models? Because I I think we we talk about that a lot in the context of making breakthroughs on uh, women in leadership, on visible minorities in leadership. uh, And and it's important, I think, for people to understand that, that children and young adults, they they look around and, and what they see is going to have an impact on the path they choose, right? That it, the more women they see in leadership, the more likely as girls and young women, they're going to pursue leadership roles. That's so critical, I think. Yeah. I mean, you don't, if you don't see yourself, then you can't picture it. You can't picture it. So it's, you know, I remember going to the movies with one of my nieces and it was one of the Disney flicks, sort of a cartoon. And the main character was a young uh, teenager of color with curly hair and with, you know, just the way that I look, the way my niece looks. And we watched this movie and I'm crying. And my niece looks over and she's like, why, you know, why are you crying? This is like a great movie. And I, and I sort of had to talk to her after and say, it's the first time. I didn't grow up with cartoon characters like that. I didn't, grow, I didn't grow up with magazines filled with, you know, women of color that were, you know, so the beauty standard didn't include the way that I looked. Now that's different. And now we have very many more images. And so I look at my nieces and I look at young women of color and I think the world is so much broader for them so yeah what you see around you who you meet uh who you work with it's it's powerful and it's a little harder when you you don't have those role models in your life sort of on a daily weekly monthly basis right and this is why as mayor i am out like this pandemic has thrown me off my game but i have been I walk up to people. I'm out. I want to connect with people because that in-person contact, uh, particularly with young people, I invited classrooms and classrooms into City Hall so that they could um, look at City Hall, but also look at me, talk to me and see what um, accessible, diverse leadership can look like. I want to go back to your childhood for a moment because there are a couple of stories that I think are worth telling. Uh, you described a very positive experience around your parents and they obviously mm-hmm. created a wonderful environment for you and your siblings, but there were some moments and and I know uh, when the decision was taken recently, ridiculously recently to shelve the Aunt Jemima brand mm-hmm. from the, uh, the syrup, the pancake syrup, uh, that that brought back a memory for you. So could could you share that? Sure. So Black Lives Matter this year, wow, has been um, incredible. And there have been so many changes, right? For some reason, I mean, the, the, the image of George Floyd, you know, the knee on the neck, the the eight minutes and 56 seconds. I mean, those are so powerful. And it seems like we are all listening more because this has been going on for centuries, right? But this year we seem to be listening more. George Floyd has, has, has made things more, has, has resonated for people. And so a lot of things have happened since then, Uh, marches, including in Cornwall and Aunt Jemima, Quaker Oats, announcing just a few weeks ago that they would remove the image of Aunt Jemima from the maple syrup in their products was one of those weird moments where it was announced on, you know, radio. And I said, oh, like, because there had been a series of announcements and this was yet another corporate entity that was going to make a change. And I picked up the phone and I called my sister. And we talked about the fact that she was called 
Aunt Jemima, um, all through high school. Your and sister that, was. That, my sister. Yeah. Yeah. In Montreal. And that there was, you know, some bullying around that. And I was aware of that story. I lived that with her. We went to the same high school. I'm her older sister, her big sister. I always carried pain around that of not being able to protect her from that. And so when I talked to her on the phone about that, and we were sort of saying, you know, this is finally going to be gone. We both just cried on the phone. Uh, And it was like, this is decades ago, Mark, decades ago. And suddenly we were reliving this like it was yesterday with that same emotion, but different now because obviously we're, you know, well-adjusted, successful women in our lives, um, very much due to our parents' love, unconditional love. But here we are understanding that that pain from high school around Aunt Jemima, around what that means, around being labeled in that way, in that disrespectful way, um, that, that we carry that still to this day. And it was good for us to be able to cry about it and it was good for me, is good for me now to be able to speak out loud about that, that that didn't necessarily get in our way of being successful or of loving our families and our lives, but that it hurts and that we carry that hurt. And we don't want young kids to carry that hurt. We don't want that for them. Let's talk about Black Lives Matter and your response and reaction to it. And I know there yeah. was a, a protest in Cornwall in June, which I believe was the largest in the city's history at that point. Yeah. Um, it, what was that moment like? Wow. So, I mean, it was tough being mayor during a pandemic. I, just may I say that first? Wow, this is not what you sign up for when you run for mayor. Um, and then when, when the video um, and the death of George Floyd um, came to light, you know, I remember watching that video. And for me, it's a turning point in terms of, you know, um, my identity and understanding that I have to uh, do more work around supporting others in their struggles with their identity and, and, you know, how they're treated in society. And then these two young women, three young women, actually, uh, two women of color and a white woman, three colleagues together, said, we're going to put on a Black Lives Matter uh, peaceful march in Cornwall. There were about a thousand people, Mark. I've never in my 30 years here uh, seen such a march. It was uh, beautiful. It was stressful because in June, we weren't yet sure about this virus, how it was to be outside. Um, So I gave out hundreds and hundreds of masks Uh, at the start of the uh, march to make sure that people were as safe as they could be in this march. I was severely criticized for participating in it. Um, Editorials in the paper were like, well, you've just told us to stay home for months and now you're going to be out at a march. And I had to explain to people that this is where I needed to be. I am a black woman. This was a black lives matter march. I am a black woman mayor I had to be there. I had to take the mic. I had to speak of my father's experiences here in Canada, the good and the bad. And I had to march uh, with those thousand people in Cornwall. And I did so alongside the police chief, by the way. Police chief Aikman uh, walked every inch of that march with me. Nice. You still, and I've read you use, uh, I've, I've read a number of articles in which you use this word, you still approach these issues from a place of love. You've expressed that a few times. There, mm-hmm. there are people who are angry. There are people who are resentful. There are people who feel this is long overdue. How do you and why do you approach it from a place of love? Because of my father. He came to Canada and was unable to find a job, right? So he had gone to university, became a teacher, had all his certificates, and he was pounding the pavement trying to find a job as a teacher. And he was coming up against closed doors. He finally went to a um, Catholic priest for help. He, um, a white Catholic priest, and he said, I, I can't get work and I need, I need help. 
And this priest helped him directly to get work. Um, actually uh, wrote a letter, made calls, and my father was able to get a job. When my father tells that story, and he has told it many times, when he tells that story, he doesn't talk about the anger he felt at not being able to break through, which he understood was in large part due to his race. What he speaks about is that priest who helped him and how in Canada you can expect to, along the way, find people who are going to help you and who are going to understand and want the best for you. So to me, my father approaches all of those things from a place of love, even though you can feel angry um, because you understand in your gut that there's discrimination going on. He taught us that we have to look for the good. And I'm learning too, through all of this um, Black Lives Matter and police services, you know, when we're trying to make our police service more inclusive, um, more open, we can't go from a place of defensiveness, making them feel defensive, which they are feeling defensive, it's going to um, mean that the work is going to take longer. So if you approach it with love and kindness, people are more receptive to understanding that they need to listen more, need to make changes, need to improve. If they understand that, that we're in a place of safe love and not a place of anger. And I get that people are angry. I get it. We need that. We need the anger. It makes, it, it pushes all of us. But once you have to do the work, Mark, once you have to get down and you're sitting around those decision-making tables, approaching it from a place of love makes the work um, a lot easier, goes a lot faster. Do you feel like that's where we're at today, that we are now getting down to the work? Uh, because I hesitate before becoming optimistic <laughs> yes. because we've been here before. Uh, there have been moments before. There have been other incidents involving the police where there's been a reaction and a response and people have said, we can't let this happen again. And then we still had George Floyd. There have been incidents since George Floyd. So yes. are you confident that this is a real turning point? I am because I have been a black woman all my life and I have had more conversations about race in the last six months than I have had in the last 20 years. So there is something different about this time. This is, this is Black Lives Matter pandemic version. I don't know if it's, a, you know, all of those events coming together to make it more powerful in terms of our awareness, our listening. We all had to stay home and think more. <laughs> and read more and turn inward a little bit. And I feel like it's different. Now, you know, you may want to interview me a few years from now and say, Bernadette, you were a little too hopeful, but I always want to be accused of being more hopeful, right? Than not. So I'm feeling confident that this is making a difference and I'm going to do my best in all of the roles that I am in to uh, pursue the conversation. Do you feel additional pressure as a black woman leader and as the first black mayor in Ontario, black woman mayor in Ontario and the first woman to be mayor of Cornwall? Uh, because unfortunately, there, there is, you're not just you. Uh, when, when somebody is the first to do something, they represent their entire gender, their entire race, right? That's true. And... So the truth is that I feel a lot of pressure. Um, it's sometimes a really great weight to bear. I don't want to mess up. I want this to be um, a great uh, mayoralty because I want young kids, young women, young black women to see that and go, yep, yeah, that's something that we can do. It's not scary. Um, but it's... You don't want to wreck it for everybody else, right? Yeah. That's, I, I hate to put it that way, but that's, that's the dynamic sometimes, right? 
It is, but it's kind of an impossible thing to live up to, right? Because, I mean, we learn in life that we're supposed to make mistakes. That's how, that's how you know you're in the arena, right? That's how you know when you're out there making those mistakes, doing your work. But um, in uh, an elected role, you are always in the public eye. And so your mistakes are magnified, right? And so I worry about that piece. Uh, And then I have to understand that I may not always choose, you know, um, where I'm going to make mistakes. I can always choose how I react to those. And so I have to choose to, to react always with, you know, grace and uh, respect. And so that's a, that's, a lot to bear because sometimes you just want to make a mistake and mess up and be a regular human. But I feel like sometimes I have to be um, afraid of being just regular and have to be sort of super at everything. How do you handle that pressure and those expectations? And and how do you handle pressure generally? I, uh, so I have a treadmill in my basement and it is not a dusty treadmill, Mark. I don't have laundry hanging off it. Good for I you. actually use it. <laughs> and so people have, have teased me about um, describing myself as a runner. I am a runner. I am a woman with curves and uh, a fuller figure. But that doesn't mean that I'm not a runner. So I run. I run uh, every week, probably 10 to 12 miles um, every week. And that's a huge support because it's um, good for my body, but mostly for my head. It gets me out of my head, uh, making me feel grateful for uh, being healthy and strong. Um, I have this one body I've been given. I want to take care of it. I also have, you know, good family relationships. I have, you know, I still have my parents. My dad is 98 and my mom is 87. I, um, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. And I don't want to have regrets about not spending as much time with them as possible. So close relationship with my parents and family. And that makes you more resilient, for sure. You talked earlier about pushing against perceptions when it comes to how you approach the job of being mayor, uh, and how, and I think all women in leadership roles have encountered this, that you have to make a choice about whether you're going to lead the way men have led in the role and and adopt the leadership practices of a traditionally male environment or whether you're going to lead in a different way. And that can't be easy. So just give me some insight into that process and that thinking and how you approach leadership. You know what? It's harder than I thought it would be. Um, I am one who seeks consensus. Now, I don't, you know, men seek consensus as well. Um, Women do, though, um, more so, I would say. Um, It is a natural fit for us to seek consensus. And I remember um, a person in the media suggesting that I'm a good consensus seeker, but am I going to be a good leader? Well, I think consensus seeking is actually a feature of leadership. It's not one or the other, but it was interesting that this male, um, you know, opinion out there was that it wasn't right. And early on in, in my mayoralty, as I was explaining, I was called upon to be making decisions, right? And they would say, okay, well, we need your decision by three o'clock today. And I'm like, no, no, I've got to make a few phone calls before because I've got to, I've got to check to make sure that this different stakeholders are in agreement with this. And the reaction was phone calls. No, you just, you just got to make that decision. No. So there is a different timeline and I don't mean that it's slower. It's just the priority is on uh, seeking consensus on consultation. That also means that I run my council meetings in a way that is different as well. And we've worked that through. We have a big council. We have a great council in the city of Cornwall. We have very 10 councillors. They're super respectful. We don't always agree. Mark, banish that from your mind. We have disagreements all the time. But the 10 people around the table, I want them to be able to 
speak. Um, I want them to be able to have the time that they need to uh, explain to the public why they're making their decisions, right? So that means that sometimes the meetings are a little longer. And I've been criticized for that. Like, well, you know, you're letting them talk. Well, yeah, but that's part of the process. The public has a right to know why their elected officials are deciding the way they are. And so we have 11 of them sitting around the table. They have a right to get up and motivate their, you know, their decisions. And that takes time. So leadership for me means more consultation, means more consensus seeking, sometimes um, allowing more opportunity for communication. And that is using time in a different way. What I find interesting about that is that a lot of people would, would run that through the filter of, leadership practices and say that's indecisiveness right and that's that there's that there's a weakness in that because you're not you don't have the answer but in a way that's the filter of male leadership or the filter of traditional leadership which has happened to be dominated by males over Mm -hmm. the last two centuries right so exactly. And there, are, there have been times where I have been sort of more decisive quickly, right? More without necessarily consulting. And there is a somewhat a satisfaction there because, you know, it's fast, right? You're, it's done and then you move on to number two, number three, number four on your list. But the times where I have sought consensus, those decisions are solid. They're solid. They're defensible. And so when you're criticized or attacked for those decisions, they're sol- you're like, here's the thing. We talked, everybody had a chance to speak, they're solid. And I find that those decisions for our council have been the best ones. And we actually walk away from them feeling, well, maybe it wasn't the way that I wanted it to go, but I had an opportunity to speak and everybody did. So the decision is solid. The times where it's quicker, where I'm not consulting, I'm on shakier ground. I don't feel as good about those decisions and neither, neither does the public. What else have you learned about leadership in your time as mayor or even in your time in politics? That it is a team effort, right? So when we think of leader, like when I think of leader, I can picture, you know, different prime ministers. I can picture Barack Obama, but it's, it's not, it's not that. I, for me, the experience that I have with leadership is the people around you. Um, when I started the term, I sat down with each one of the 10 counselors that were elected with me. Uh, and I said, you know what, let's just meet and we'll talk for an hour. And each one of them um, spoke to me for two hours. And wow, did I ever get an insight into how they see their term, what contributions they want to make. And that is good for me as the leader to understand the team around me, with me. And I did it again. So I did it at the top of the term and then midterm, like the next year. And I'm going to keep doing that because you're only as strong as the people around you. And if they're not strong or if they're struggling, then you are too as a leader and you're not going to be effective. So this whole single person aspect of leadership has gone by the wayside. And I have a a better understanding that it really is about empowering the people around you. Something we haven't touched on yet, which is relevant, highly relevant, I think. And maybe there are some time management lessons you can share with all of us is the fact that you also, in addition to being mayor of Cornwall, are running a legal aid clinic in the city of Cornwall. You were doing that before you became mayor. You've kept doing it while you've been mayor. So tell me a little bit about why you chose to do that, because my understanding is you were working at a good law firm in Ottawa and you decided to take a job with a legal aid clinic in Cornwall. And this is obviously a passion of yours. So what went into that and why have you kept doing it, even as you have taken on the very demanding job of being mayor? Right. I, uh, yeah, I articled at Pearlie Robertson, a great firm in Ottawa, and I realized that pri- private practice wasn't for me. Um, I wanted to uh, have more direct contact with people and feel um, helpful and useful in, in very sort of deep ways. 
and legal aid was the right fit. I'm so grateful because I got on a bus and went to Cornwall and got that job. And now I'm in, in a place that I love so much and that is so much a part of my life. And so it was impossible for me to think about leaving the legal clinic. Um, that work, that one-on-one -on -one work with people who are uh, more vulnerable in our community informs my work as mayor. So it means that I have an understanding of what it is to struggle in this community. And that understanding helps me when I'm around the council table in terms of making decisions about what's good for our community. It was important for me to continue to do both. And I was criticized for that during the campaign, by the way. People said, who does she think she is? She's not going to be able to do all that. You should never tell a woman that she's not going to be able to do all that. <laughs> never do that. <laughs> so it was interesting because I, I am part-time at the legal clinic. I am the executive director. I had to go part-time to, of course, accommodate full-time mayoral work. And it's, it, it really, the two are connected. And in the legal clinic, I feel like I'm connected to a, a real workplace, like other people are connected to a workplace. City hall is a little bit different. Politics is a little bit different. Sometimes you can Sometimes you can be a little bit removed um, if you stay in it long enough and you don't keep your foot uh, grounded in something real. And that something real for me is the legal aid clinic. So I see both as absolutely essential for me in terms of being a good executive director at the legal clinic and a good mayor. Yeah, it's not always practical, but I, I like what you said there, uh, that you're maintaining a connection. And I think a lot more politicians would benefit from having that connection to the real community and not just the the unusual space in which they travel, uh, which which becomes a, a substitute. They, they, it starts to feel normal to them, but it's not the normal world the rest of us are in sometimes. So, right. Yeah. Great. You need to, you need to buy your own milk. You need to know what the price of milk is uh, every day, right? Because then you have to understand what that means for uh, people who might struggle to, to buy milk, right? So what are your time management uh, tools and practices? How do you get this all done? <laughs> wow. So this is not my area of expertise. And I guess, but there are some gender issues here. I am uh, a single woman with no children. And I think that if I were married with children, it would be really difficult to be in elected office, number one, or to be able to do these things. So I think there are still a ways to go in supporting women, particularly younger women, in running for office. It, it's, it's hard to picture how that could be done by a younger woman. I'm also 55, right? So I am at a stage in my life where I can uh, control my time more. So time management is not a huge strength <laughs> in terms of uh, being organized. I just give a lot of my time to my work. And thankfully, I love my work. Both jobs give me great joy, uh, terrific challenges, a great control as well. I'm fortunate to be a leader because you can control your time a bit more. But if I were a married mom, I don't think it would be possible. And I think that that's a bad thing. I think we need to continue to think about how we get moms, um, married moms or, you know, moms with partners uh, into elected office. And I've, I've read about how women have to be asked more times to run for office mm -hmm. than men before they say yes. And I think if I'm not mistaken, you're an example of that, right? Definitely. I love politics. And I think that I probably should have run when I was younger, but I was 40 before I could contemplate doing that. I'd never pictured myself in that role, never seen women in around the council table, uh, uh, women of color around the council table. In fact, uh, at the time that I ran for city council, there were no women around the council table. There had been one woman previously, you get boroughs, uh, a great inspiration, but she was alone there, and it uh, it was it was hard for her around that table. And I had to be asked many times 
by many different people to run. I just didn't think well, I, they won't elect me and what skills do I have? I mean, I was a lawyer. <laughs> I love to talk and to advocate. I think those are good skills for a politician, but for some reason I doubted that uh, until I was in my 40s and, and had lots of people ask. So what's your greatest hope for the future when it comes to children, when it comes to girls, when it comes to black children growing up in your community, in this country, throughout North America? What's your greatest hope? That they have no limit in how they see their future, that they don't think, well, I can't do this. I can't, that they don't think in terms of I can't that they think in terms of, I want to do this, I want to try this, and I want to do this and try this because I've seen other women try and succeed and do this. I just want kids to feel that their future is limitless. I want them to feel that way because they have a lot of work to do. You know, environmentally, we have some big challenges and if we don't empower kids now to feel strong about themselves and their identity and their role, they're not going to be able to um, take on these challenges. They're just going to struggle um, with mental health issues, with um, identity issues, with self-esteem issues. And we're just going to keep going down the wrong road. We need people that are strong enough to help save the planet. That's such a great point, because I think we have to do both. We have to change the environment and we've got to it change and inspire young people to take on these challenges. We got to do both. Yeah. You can't do just one thing. eh? You learn in life that you have to do it all. I've learned that more than ever around the council table. You know, you have to work at the $58 million wastewater treatment plant. You also have to worry about the goose poop in the park. You know, you also have to worry about the recreation programs and how kids are going to be able to access that, even though they don't have, the money to do so. So you have to also work about worry about economic development, attracting investors. You have to do it all at once. And I think you also have to focus on improving rather than solving, right? Because some yeah. some problems are too big to solve in a short time frame. So you just have to devote your energy to making the situation better as best as it can be rather than get paralyzed about how do we achieve the ultimate solution here? And then we actually don't achieve anything. I've been using the word incrementalism a lot lately. It's kind of a fancy word, but it is what you what we what you do right you go bit by bit day by day and you have to stay in the moment you have to do long term planning but you have to stay in the joy of the moment people need things right now they need to know that you're listening right now and there is joy in being present in the moment it's so joyful to be in the moment so you got to do that and plan well it's been a great joy talking with you today, Bernadette. You are such an inspiration. You have so much to say and such a powerful story to share. I'm so grateful for your time and all the lessons that I've learned from listening to you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. You're a great interviewer. You made this such an easy and pleasant conversation. Merci. I find Bernadette's story so inspiring and her perspective so thought-provoking. I really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you did too. I love Bernadette's energy. I love what she said about consensus, about starting from a place of love, even when you're talking about issues like racism. So once again, a huge thank you to Bernadette Clément for joining us on Digging Deep. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please review it and share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes like this one. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, You have lots of options. You can subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can read my blog and more. All of it at letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Thank you for listening.